Kia ora again from Endometriosis New Zealand. March is International Endometriosis Awareness Month and earlier we've talked to you about the fact that we're going to be bringing you some video clips and newsy bits and something special just for you and we hope that you've already checked that out to see what it is. We're so excited. Today I'm going to be interviewing Professor Neil Johnson. Neil has uh, a string of wonderful things he's done in his career, but let me just tell you that he is a member of the Endometriosis Special Interest Group. You can look him up, we call that ESIG. You can look him up on ESIG on the EndoNZ website. Uh, he's also a board member on the Endometriosis New Zealand Board. He's the World Endometriosis Society President. He's got so many published papers to his name and we're just really excited that he's given us the opportunity to talk to him today. And the thing that we've asked him about specifically is, can you let us know a little bit more about research? And so we're going to pose to him some of the questions that you have asked us about that subject. So I'd really like to warmly uh, introduce you to Professor Neil Johnson. Thank you for that outrageous uh, introduction and uh, I'm not sure where all of that came from but uh, thank you nonetheless. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Thanks Neil. Look, the questions that people have asked us around research and it can be there's so much that is happening and so much that's frustrating that isn't happening so some of those things we're going to ask you today. Here's the questions that have come to us uh, to run during this campaign. So we'd really love you to talk to us about global research and some of the things that are happening. Um, well, there is plenty happening uh, in the world in uh, relation to endometriosis research. Um, some of the things I'm involved with uh, at, uh, at a sort of a World Endometriosis Society level. So what we've been trying to do there is to in a way draw all the strands of all the very good research that has already been done together uh, in a sequence of consensus statements that the World Endometriosis Society has put out. So um, I think people may know that the World Endometriosis Society has a, a world meeting every three years uh, and for the last uh, I suppose three of those meetings we've been having consensus meetings with uh, with people who represent many of the societies with a strong interest in, in endometriosis uh, to see if we can come to some sort of consensus and the first of those was uh, was in Montpellier when we uh, addressed current management of endometriosis so I suppose endometriosis treatment uh, and this was published in 2013. Uh, the second and third consensus meeting that we had was in Sao Paulo at the next World Congress on Endometriosis and we published the consensus on classification of endometriosis, that's important and we're about to hopefully soon publish the consensus on the diagnosis of endometriosis and then we had uh, another couple of excellent meetings, one uh, during the World Congress on Endometriosis in Vancouver uh, when we talked about patient-centered uh, outcomes and I think that that was a very uh, important one because this is a principle that we've really woken up to in recent years that, that it is important to have women themselves involved in research agendas and defining those uh, research agendas uh, and then we've recently uh, after that World Congress also had a meeting on uh, the structure of specialist care in endometriosis so I'm thinking particularly about what we used to call uh, centers of expertise uh, in endometriosis mm. uh, that we now refer more to as uh, networks well centers or networks of expertise formerly known as sorry centers of excellence um, and uh, and I think that hopefully we'll be able to draw all the strands of the very good research that's been done in many of these areas some well researched some less well researched in fact uh, together to uh, present a, uh, a sort of a coherent um, presentation from, from all of that research that's been done over the years. So that's 
kind of drawing together a bit of historic stuff. Shall I go on? Well, Neil, I, I actually think that that's absolutely wonderful. And I think that it's really reassuring for women to know that there is research happening and that, that as part of the World Endometriosis Society that those conclusions are being drawn. But also, if any of our followers here would like to see what those papers are and read further about them, you can find them under research on the Endometriosis New Zealand website or you can look up the um, endometriosis.org, the global platform. So there are place, places where uh, followers can actually access those and read them for themselves. And I think that's really important too. Exactly. And that, yeah. is, uh, that is really important. Mm. Um, so look, the second question you've almost asked in the first question, which is brilliant, but it says what's happening and where and about the World Endometriosis Society and what are the global movements? I think we've almost covered that, but is there anything else that you would like to, to talk about? Well, we have covered a, a lot of it in terms of uh, sort of those consensus statements or research summaries, um, but I think also one of the very exciting things that, that happened at the last World Congress in Vancouver um, was, and this is the first time that I've seen this at any uh, conference uh, that I've ever been to before or, or since, was that there were four uh, presentations of, uh, of novel and original research at that, at that World Congress that were synchronously at exactly the same time as they were being presented at the conference. Wow. Uh, they were published in very high impact uh, international journals. So there was one Lancet publication uh, and there were three New England Journal of Medicine publications. Mm. Uh, of four rather key uh, pieces of research. Would you like to hear a bit about, uh, very briefly about well, those ones? Well, just honestly, if you can touch on what they were, it's quite exciting, isn't yes. it? Yes, well it is, and, and the first one relates a little bit to one of the um, the World Endometriosis Society consent, consensus statements that I was just talking about, which relates to patient-centred outcomes. Uh, and this was a paper that was published in The Lancet and also presented in uh, uh, in Vancouver by Andrew Horn and his group from the mm. United Kingdom uh, that's really looking at uh, the interest in research outcomes uh, and how researchers see them and how women see them. And it was very interesting to see that there were many similarities, mm. but also some differences. And obviously high on women's agenda mm. is please, can we find a cure for endometriosis? Absolutely. Wasn't that number one mm -hmm. on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the preferred outcomes? Indeed it was. Yeah. And strangely, it was number three on the researchers' outcomes. We were a bit interested in, okay. uh, you know, how can you find a, um, a non-invasive test for endometriosis? Yeah. But women are just very, very interested in the cure, and I completely get that. Yeah. So, uh, so that was very interesting. Um, and if I can jump in there, the nice thing about that is that women are now being consulted. And uh, forums like Endometriosis New Zealand and other organisations around the world of a similar nature are, can, are asking their membership. And I think the, 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 the difference now is that clinicians, researchers are interested in what patients have to say. Uh, and absolutely, listening. we are. And, mm. uh, and I think on the other side of that, of course, um, women suffering from endometriosis themselves are now... Perhaps much more interested in the in the in, in the um, the findings, the results, and the conclusions yes. of the research yeah. because they've had a um, some input into the research mm. questions mm. in the first place. So it is hugely uh, important. Yeah. yeah, and further to that too, we actually find that women really appreciate being asked mm. to complete surveys because they know that they're contributing yeah. to the literature in some way. Right. So we find that, and, and of course they might something might not resonate with them, a research that we might post, mm. but at least they have the choice then exactly. of being part of that mm. study. So that was the first one, Deborah, uh, and there were three others. Uh, I'll briefly tell, tell you about them. Please and, do. Uh, so the first was, uh, was a fantastic paper that was published in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine and, of course, presented in Vancouver from uh, Catherine Allaire's uh, group in Vancouver uh, and their collaborators looking at, uh, actually, at, at mutations in the deep lesions of, uh, from women with very uh, severe and deep endometriosis. And the amazing thing was that they found a lot of, um, actually, a lot of cancer-related uh, gene mutations within a decent percentage of those lesions. Mm. Now, um, you know, you might be thinking, oh, well, that doesn't sound very good. But, but, but of course, we do know 
that endometriosis is by its nature and even deep endometriosis is a benign uh, condition. Um, and I think what we recognize is, is that lesions need several of these mutations mm. to actually become a cancer. So it's, it, it's not alarming from that perspective. But what it does, uh, I think, open up is the potential for new treatment avenues. So that was a, that was a lovely paper. Mm. Uh, and then we had one from uh, Ben Moll's um, Dutch group who uh, had conducted a fantastic Dutch multicenter study on something that, that actually I'd been very interested in uh, uh, many years ago and done some research on in, uh, in Auckland, something called lapiodol, which is a, a fertility treatment, and it's given by a, a hysterosalpingogram, or HSG, which is the X-ray contrast procedure for women and their uterus and fallopian tubes. Uh, and what, um, what the Dutch group found was really, I suppose, a validation of the profound fertility benefit. But what we've known since I suppose 2004 is that this has a really remarkable fertility benefit, particularly for women with endometriosis, more so than women who don't have endometriosis. So, for example, uh, if you've got endometriosis and you have a lapidol procedure, if you've been struggling with infertility, uh, it improves fourfold wow. the chance of getting pregnant. So that was uh, that's another big thing, and it's really, uh, I suppose. Um, uh, rejuvenated the interest in in lapidol, and that again was published in the New England Journal of Medicine at the same time that it was uh, uh, that it was presented in Vancouver. Uh, and then the final, um, I suppose, high impact bit of research that was presented in Vancouver was the uh, was the multi center study looking at the new um, medication. So it's a it's actually an oral GnRH antagonist called Elagolix. Uh, and this was a multi-center randomized trial again uh, that really showed the benefit of that particular agent. So I think it's exciting that we're seeing mm. new agents coming through, mm. uh, new potential treatments. Uh, in, in New Zealand, there's a bit of a frustration because we don't seem to be able to get them very quickly. Uh, and there are certain reasons behind all of that. Um, but I, I think one of the interesting things about that piece of research uh, is that it was actually funded and sponsored by the company who make the uh, Elagolix, and that obviously introduces its own uh, potential challenges. Uh, yes, and many of the women around the world who do have endometriosis, uh, I really jumped the gun <laughs> here a little bit and jumped a few questions, but, mm -hmm. you know, uh, are, are really, um, you know, it has raised a whole lot of other challenges mm -hmm. about... You know, is that even is that even proper? Should we even be accepting that sort of thing, uh, where you get a company, um, a pharmaceutical company, for instance, who are supporting research in their own product? Look, I agree, and I, uh, for about twenty years in my own career, uh, I carried the same scepticism uh, about this, um, and I think we we recognise that uh, there are certain concerns that have been raised about um, pharmaceutical industry-sponsored research. Uh, things like the design of the study, is it, you know, the, the inclusion criteria so tight as to ex exaggerate the, mm. the potential treatment effect? Um, is it that we're, um, you know, only seeing published uh, certain outcomes that, mm. that sort of make it a little bit more rosy than it is? Um, is it even that if there's an unfavorable result from a study that it gets buried and never yes. gets published? Yeah. You know, so I think there are all of these concerns, as well as just the plain and simple look, this is industry funded. And I think in everyone's eyes, it potentially tarnishes uh, uh, that research. Mm. So for about 20 years in my own career as a junior researcher and then as a senior researcher, uh, I really steered a very narrow course away yeah. from uh, that kind of thing. But uh, uh, and I think I have to declare my own conflict of interest now in uh, in making this statement to say that I was involved in this particular study, in the study of uh, uh, Elagolix that was funded by AbbVie, the, mm. uh, um, the drug company. Um, and I'm also now involved in a new study that we're just launching at the moment and about to hopefully randomize our first patient. Again, again it's... Uh, um, and and I've, I'm actually on the advisory board for this uh, for this particular trial, which is uh, which is funded by Myovan Sciences. Mm. So I've now seen it from both sides, mm. and you know if I can say anything, um, I can hopefully be broadly reassuring that this kind of research 
is really conducted to a very, very high level. No T remains uncrossed, no I remains undotted. Uh, the design of the studies is, well, as far as I've seen anyway, unimpeachable. Um, the conduct of the studies is extremely rigorous. I've never seen any evidence that we're publishing only selective outcomes, and I have never, uh, certainly there, there would not be any spirit to not publish the research, even mm. if it did not have a favorable outcome for the particular agent under consideration. So, uh, admittedly, I may not know the full ins and outs of, uh, of everything about this, but from, from what I have seen, um, these particular trials are well conducted, this is good research, these are people within the companies who have a genuine desire to, to help women with mm. endometriosis and a genuine scientific uh, endeavor, mm. uh, as far as I can judge. Uh, and I think that, you know, research in, uh, in endometriosis is competing with uh, research. So women with endometriosis need to be aware that we're competing for the research dollar with a lot of other very worthy causes. And it is not easy to get research funding. And so I'm now of the view that I am glad that I'm in a field where uh, industry sponsorship is available for certain research mm. projects. And there will always be the question mark about whether the research is tarnished. But to my mind, it's well conducted research. Um, uh, and... You know, I'm actually grateful for the uh, for the funding that uh, yeah. th that we have, uh, and I think you know perhaps people will say, "Oh, well, he would say that now. He's kind of one of them," um, and I get that as well. I understand that. Yeah. yeah, I think. Look, I think you know from a from a patient's perspective, a woman with endometriosis, uh, they want a cure, and we represent. 120,000 girls and women in New Zealand with endometriosis. And I think if we ask them, look, take this drug, uh, they would all say, or many of them would say, look, if this is going to solve my problem, even though it may not be a cure, because we know, don't we, I think we have to declare that there is no drug at the moment which can cure endometriosis. Uh, and there will be many women and they've got absolutely right. I think it's wonderful that these days we can have choice. Uh, but it would be wonderful also to have something that that for women was going to uh, help their symptoms. Absolutely. I, just on that note, Deborah, I hear a lot, even from um, fairly esteemed colleagues, that there is no cure for endometriosis. Now, that sounds a bit bleak, actually, because mm. um, to my mind, probably about half of all women are actually cured by surgery. So when they have laparoscopic mm. surgery... Um, about half will be cured or more or less cured of, the, mm. of their endometriosis. Or at least have so, their symptoms significantly reduced exactly. so they can live well with the disease. Exactly. I, I mean, I think it's certainly true that, that half will have further problems and, mm. and do need a long-term management program. And this is, this is partly why we're engaged in the structure mm. of specialist care, looking at multidisciplinary care, interdisciplinary care. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it's as bleak uh, in terms of effecting a cure mm. uh, and being close to um, uh, other means of effecting a cure um, that, we're, that we're really working on in terms of research that, that, that it's sometimes promoted as. Yeah, what I really appreciate that you've done today, Neil, is declared it. You've talked about it. And, you know, there'll be people who are going to comment and they also have a right to do that. Absolutely. But, you know, I think that we are talking about it and that's, that's uh, a wonderful thing that yeah. this interview has, has certainly raised and that we all have choice. Look, the next question, if we can briefly touch on this one, because it came through just, uh, in fact, just before Christmas from mm. a, a woman in New Zealand. Clinical trials for endo and the developments in immunotherapy in the field of endometriosis research. Is there anything that you can tell us about that? Um, well, we have known for a long time that, um, that endometriosis does have an autoimmune component. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly there are quite a few agents that have been looked at for their potential for immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. And I suppose you would say that 
that our own lapiodol is is one of those mm. because it seems to be having an immunobiological effect on women's fertility, probably on the endometrium yeah. or probably within the pelvic cavity. But there are other agents as well. It's probably <coughs> fair to say, Deborah, that the um, it's early days mm. in terms of the full and thorough uh, evaluation of immu immunotherapeutic mm. agents. So it's definitely um, an area where we need to be looking. Yeah. Look, the other thing that I, I meant to say before, Neil, is that I so appreciate you saying, look, we know actually that surgical excision of endometriosis is the gold standard, it's best practice, and many women respond. Mm -hmm. But we also are uh, needing to be looking at uh, is there a, what medical interventions can we have for those women who either don't respond to surgery or have the choice Yes. of not proceeding to, yeah. to surgical uh, excision of disease. And that we also know that a lot of this comes down to the evidence-based self-management type things that women can introduce. And Endometriosis New Zealand does have some wonderful resources on the website that you can start looking at that too. So I just wanted to pop that in there. Yeah, and, and not only those things, Deborah, but I think we recognise that there is a group of women who will have surgery, but who would otherwise need surgery again mm. um, if they didn't have some kind of medical prevention strategy following the surgery. Mm. So, so medical treatment approaches are a really good support to, uh, uh, to surgical treatment as well. At the moment, and that we can only apply what we absolutely know right now that's going to work. So thanks for that. Uh, one question here is that what's the chance of inheriting the disease? Is there a screen test? Chance of inheriting it, it does run in families a bit, unfortunately. So, um, you know, if you're a woman with endometriosis and you have daughters, um, then they are unfortunately a bit more likely to get endometriosis than, uh, than your neighbour who might have daughters who doesn't have endometriosis. So uh, the, the difficult thing is that, uh, that endometriosis seems to, be, seems to be controlled by a number of genes. Uh, as well as probably some environmental influences, and we're we're still a little bit in the dark over what some of those environmental influences mm. are. So it is a it is a complex inherited mm. uh, disease. Um, so there isn't, unlike some conditions, there isn't one big gene that we can identify and uh, and then look to see whether you're a carrier of that gene, and then perhaps look to. Uh, uh, to prevent it. But, you know, there's still ongoing research at the level of um, uh, the gene and, uh, and we're still looking to see, uh, and I think if there, if there will ever be a screening test, and we do need to be careful about screening tests in endometriosis because we don't want to, to generate a whole population of worried well around the place, mm. but if there ever will be um, a screening test in the future. I suspect that it will be genetically based. Mm. Look, this is a social media awareness campaign, and right at this moment, I also have to talk about the ME program in schools. So it's a menstrual health and endometriosis program, and without any uh, screening, if we can avail young people the information about what's normal and what's not, so that we are intervening early and getting them the, the help that they need. I think that at the moment, that's one of the best, uh, if you want to call it, it's, it's, it's outside, but it is about education, isn't it? Look, th that is the most powerful tool that we have at the moment um, to empower girls and young women to recognize the symptoms, to understand the symptoms, to understand that their symptoms might be due to endometriosis and they might not be as well. Um, and once you have that knowledge, then you can have much more choice in terms of what you do about that. So I think as a, uh, as a young woman uh, and as a, as a girl at school, that education program cannot be underestimated. Thank it's you so much. huge importance. Well, you know, and it's now published in the literature with Anne's Jog, and that is also available on the Endometriosis New Zealand website. But I just wanted to highlight um, a very exciting development that's happening at international level at the moment, known as the EFFECT program. So that's E-P-H, big letters, small E-C-T. And that stands for, and it's almost incomprehensible when I tell you what it stands for, but I'll explain it. It stands for the Endometriosis Phenome 
decarbonisation project. What it means is that, and this was an initiative that was started in Harvard and now Boston in collaboration with the group in Oxford in the, in the UK, um, and it, it's essentially a pro forma whereby uh, anyone in the world doing endometriosis research could and should be collecting uh, the same standard data. And what this means is that research done in the UK and the US and New Zealand and Australia um, can be compared and contrasted. And I think that this is a really powerful tool that will lead us very quickly to finding the best cures, um, the best diagnostic techniques, the best preventive te techniques, and really ultimately to be able to deliver the best care to women with uh, endometriosis throughout the world. So I think that's exciting. I am so pleased you reminded me of that, Neil. And I think the, the best place that women can, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the best place that women can find out more about the EFFECT study would be on the World Endometriosis Research Foundation website or or Facebook page, is that correct? That's exactly right. right. Look, Neil, what you've done today, you've given us some nuggets of hope, which is fantastic to know, <laughs> and I think reassure women that there is research happening. Uh, and also, the, the one thing that I really like, that you've addressed the complexities and the challenges facing researchers. Mm. So we've covered a whole ground. You've been magnificent. We've loved uh, the interview, and we're sure that our followers will be uh, either lying in bed at, at, at night listening to this uh, or, or taking the opportunity to, to sit down with the uh, device and listen to what you have to say. Thank you so much, Professor Neil Johnson. It's an absolute pleasure, Deborah. Thank you.